Or last week, we looked at the mystery of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, and basically uh, showing that it's Jesus Christ and the, all those who are in Christ. And this mystery kind of goes along with that in a way. And a lot of these mysteries we're going to be looking at, um, you know, there, there are different mysteries, but it's kind of interesting how they're intertwined with each other and the way they go together. And something I didn't really talk about last week, or I didn't, I didn't clarify last week, when we talk about, you know, the kingdom of God, um, you know, it being Jesus Christ and all those who are in Christ, something I didn't really cover in that, um, that maybe would, because of that, might cause some confusion on certain verses. But one of the things that includes in entering the kingdom of God and becoming a part of the kingdom of God is the fact that we receive the promises that were made to Israel, the promises that were made to Abraham's seed. Okay. And so a lot of things that, you know, when you start talking about that, you know, people thought, you know, the kingdom's for the Jews, the kingdom's for the Jews, but no, all these promises that God made, they were to Abraham's seed, which Galatians teaches is Christ. And so, and Bible teaches, we are joint heirs with Christ. And so part of receiving the kingdom of God, of course, it is receiving Jesus Christ. It's becoming a part of the body of Christ, but it also means we receive what Christ receives, we receive that kingdom. And so, you know, just so keep all that in mind, because uh, as we look at another mystery tonight, and tonight what we're going to be talking about is the mystery of the Gentiles. The mystery of the Gentiles is, is what I'm calling it, I guess. The mystery of the Gentiles, and there is a lot of scripture on this subject. We're mostly going to stay in the New Testament. Next week, I might go back to Old Testament. We'll kind of see how much of it I get covered this week, but um, so you know, this is but there's some really interesting stuff in here that I want to show you that I, I hope will be a help to you and just kind of hopefully make things really clear to you. But let's go ahead and start reading in verse 1 of Colossians chapter 1. It says, <clears throat> Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ which are at Coloss, uh, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which ye have to all saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. And ye also learn of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will, and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God." Strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience, long suffering, with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Note that verse right there. He has made us meet to be partakers. We're going to partake. We are going to take part in something that was for someone else. Okay, and he's talking to Gentiles here that he specifically says this to. It says, whom he, uh, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Y'all see that right there? So for those who say the kingdom of God or the kingdom of, you know, the, the kingdom of heaven, it was something that was for the Jews and the gospels. Here he's saying right here in Colossians that we have been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. And so, um, that God changed us when he saved us. Okay. He made us a new creature. We are now a spiritual man. One whose sins are not imputed unto them. Not one who is without sin. Remember my message. I preached a while back on if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. And everybody wants to make that into this big change in the flesh. But if you keep reading, it shows that what's new is that our sins are not imputed unto us. We're still sinners. We still mess up, but those things are not held against us. We are still righteous in God's eyes, not because of our own righteousness, but we have the righteousness of Christ because his blood has cleansed us from our sins. 
He changed us. He made us different. And we are in Christ. And so verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church. Okay. Keep this in mind. We're going to talk about this a little bit. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Okay, in him, who's that talking about? It's talking about Jesus Christ. In him, all fullness dwell. And having made peace, through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. We used to be alienated, but God has reconciled us in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Now, how can we be unblameable? How can we be unprovable in the sight of God only through the blood of Jesus Christ? It has nothing to do with our works. It has nothing to do with our changed life. The blood of Jesus Christ, and that's it. Verse 23, if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Y'all see that? For his body's sake, which is the church. Now, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Okay? But we do not believe in a universal church. Okay, We believe in local churches, correct? But I do believe that one day there will be, for lack of a better term, a universal church. There will be one body. When is that? Well, it is after we have all been raptured. After uh, you have the new Jerusalem come down, you have the bride, the lamb's wife, and we are all together in one group and we will all be one. And then you could say, uh, you know, there, there's one church, one universal church. Why? Because we're all together. And everyone who will be a part of that are all the saved people. But notice how it says that there, uh, you know, which is behind the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church, whereof I am made minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery, which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. And I've preached this before and I don't want to, rehash this again, but you, you have the word dispensation there. And people will use that as an excuse to teach the crazy doctrines of dispensationalism. But the, the teachings of dispensationalism teach that basically there's been different plans of salvation, different ways, you know, throughout time. But the truth is we see here, you know, a dispensation is basically just when God would reveal a portion of his will. He would give them a, a dispensation or a, a dispensing or a, a, a distribution he would give them a little more of his plan and they would understand a little more. But understand what we know today, you know, the plan of salvation, you know, everything there is, while certain things about it were not revealed in the past, it was always God's plan. Okay? The Gentiles were never plan B. They were it was it was always plan A for God to do what God has done. And I'm telling you, I don't, I hope I preach this good tonight. Because when I, when I studied, when I was studying for this and I realized it, it really blew my mind and just amazed me about God and how great he is. But I might not get to the really good part until next week. I don't know. I'm going to see, I'm going to see if I can get through it if I don't ramble on these things. But <laughs> verse 26 says, even the mystery, which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to a saint. So if it wasn't there, how can it be hid? All right. It was there. It was just hidden. God hadn't revealed it yet. Verse 27, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, 
which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So this is the mystery that's among the Gentiles, Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Wherefore, I also labor, striving to his working, which worketh in me mightily. And then let's go ahead and go to chapter two, verse one, for I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them of Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ in whom are hid all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And if you jump to uh, Colossians chapter 4, verse 3, it says, With all praying also for us, that God would open us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I also am in bonds. I personally believe that all these references to this mystery here is the fact that God was going to save the Gentiles, that God was going to make these wicked heathen, he was going to make a way for them to be a part of the people of God, to be in Christ. That's a, it's a miracle. We should never get over the fact that it's, a, it's an amazing thing that we got saved. We get this attitude that somehow that we deserve it. And we do. Every day when we go out soul winning, we talk to people who think they deserve to go to heaven. That is ridiculous. We should be blown away that we are able to go to heaven. We should be blown away that God made a way of salvation for us. But sadly, that's not the mentality today. But it should be. We ought to be blown away by that. And listen, when the gospel started going to the Gentiles, it blew the minds of the Jews. I mean, God pretty much had to hit Peter over the head with it. He had to give him that vision and he just had to spell it out for him because you know, there's no way those people could get saved. But sure enough, they can get saved. And we are proof of that. God saved us. God made a way of salvation for the Gentiles. And it was something that we can look back in the Old Testament and see where that was God's plan all along. But understand, the Old Testament saints did not see that coming. They did not understand that. Even though Jesus said His last words, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, you know, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, they still didn't get it, did they? They stayed around in Jerusalem and then the persecution came. They got scattered abroad, but then they're still pretty much just going to the Jews. And it wasn't until Acts chapter 10, that story with Peter, where all of a sudden they figured it out. And even after Peter figured it out, they all got, they got together and, you know, like, sure enough, you know, Gentiles are getting saved too. They're receiving the Holy Ghost just like we are. And you know what? It was prophesied and they started quoting Old Testament scripture. Sure enough, this was God's plan all along and it blew their mind. It, that it, One, that God would do that, but it was an amazing thing too because all of a sudden the scripture was opened up to them and they understood that this was God's plan all along and we didn't see it coming. And the mystery of the Gentiles is basically when I, when I call, talk about the mystery of the Gentiles is that Gentiles can be saved. That Gentiles can can be one in Christ, that we can be the people of God, that even though we don't necessarily descend from Abraham, we can be Abraham's seed. Why? Because we're in Christ. And we can receive all those blessings. I mean, it, it, it's an amazing thing. We should never get over it. But let's look at some more scriptures on this. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 says, Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings, in heavenly places in Christ. How do we get in on these blessings? In Christ. Verse 4, According as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world. It was always His plan to do it this way. That we should be, live holy and without blame before Him in love, that, having predestinated us into the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted. In the Beloved, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace, wherein He hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, which He hath purposed in Himself, 
that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. So there we have that word dispensation again. And it comes right after he talked about the mystery of his will and talking about how we would be gathered together in one. Y'all see that? In one. And we don't have time to read through all of Ephesians, but there's a lot of things in Ephesians that show how, you know, before, well, you know, we were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. You know, Jesus broke down that middle wall of partitions. He's made us both one in Christ, referring to with the Jews, with believing Jews, and with believing Gentiles, where we've all been made one. There are not two separate groups. And that's one of the things we're going to see in these passages is how we're all one, okay? There is neither Jew nor Greek. You know, it's we're, we are all one in Christ. And sadly today, people do, they still want to break us up into groups. You know, you know, they, you know, the, they still want to call the Jews, even though they're lost and they're not saved, they want to call them the people of God, even though the Bible says they're not. It's just those who are of faith. But Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1 says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me for, to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote afore in few words, referring to what we read in chapter 1, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, Whereof I am made minister according to the gift of the grace of God, which is given unto me by the effectual working of his power. So right there, I mean, that is so clear that, you know, he's made us fellow heirs, the same body, partakers. Okay. And everyone who's saved or everyone who's going to heaven, everyone who's the people of God is because they are in Christ, not because of any physical lineage. Chapter five, verse 30 of Ephesians, for we are members of his body of his flesh and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Now this passage, I wish I had time to preach in this whole passage. I'm probably going to be doing something here in the near future on that one. But that people get so messed up on that passage because chapter five is about husbands loving their wives or that last part. It's about husbands loving their wives. But then he talks about husbands and wives being one flesh, okay? And he compares the husband and wife relationship to Christ and the church. Why? Why is he doing that? Because it's one body. Just like a husband and wife are not two, they are one. We are one in Christ. And that's one of the reasons God's giving that comparison right there. And that when he says this is a great mystery but I speak concerning Christ and the church. It's not, you know, people have taken that mystery and they've turned the church into, into something else. But that what, what that clearly is talking about is that we are one in Christ. Those of us who are saved, we are one in Christ. Okay. Remember that number one. Okay. Remember I talked about the dispensationalists. I don't even trust their ability to count. I mean, I, you really can't trust their ability to count after you see some of these things because they're always trying to make, you know, multiple groups, multiple people. No, there's all, there's one. We are all one in Christ. We are in the same group. We are in the same body of the Old Testament believers. So chapter 6, verse 19 of Ephesians, As for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Okay, The mystery of the gospel, which I believe is just, once again, that... Gentiles can be saved. And he's an ambassador in bonds. He would often go to prison because a lot of these places where he would go, they didn't want to hear the gospel and they would throw him in prison for it. But yet, it was something that would, it would save those people. 
if they would believe it. And then in Romans chapter 16, verse 25, it says, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. That just like we saw in Ephesians chapter 1, but now is made manifest, and by the scripture of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. So right there, clearly talking about the same mystery that we see in Ephesians chapter 1, because of the fact that, you know, it's that mystery that was there since the foundation of the world, and talking about how it's been made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. So the mystery of the Gentiles is just the fact that the, they could get saved, that the gospel went to them, that God was able to make them one with him. That these wicked people, and all of us, if we could go back and figure out who some of our ancestors were, we're going to find some barbarians and some pretty crazy people in there. Some of us might only have to go back one or two generations to find some pretty crazy people in there. But you know what? God didn't cast us off because of our family and our lineage. He still saved us. And that's an amazing thing. That was something that they did not understand in the Old Testament. And so the mystery of the Gentiles, that they would be made one in Christ with, I say Jewish believers, but real Jews, those who are of faith. So... Uh, but once again, people, do, they, they're always wanting to make that distinction, you know, between the church and Israel. Okay? And I mentioned last week that Spencer Smith video that he had put out there, you know, about Schofield and stuff. And, you know, he, and his quote, one of the things he said in there was, you know, Schofield is not someone we look to. He just happens to be one of the early guys who put the idea that there was a difference between Israel and and the church. He just put that in print, and that's all there is to the guy. Okay? But here's the problem with that. When they talk about the difference between Israel and the church, they are referring not to necessarily to lost, unbelieving Israel. They're still calling that group the people of God, and then you got the church over here that's another people of God. I mean, they still call them God's chosen people. But the tr truth is, God only has one people. He's made us both one, and we read all those scriptures there. So I, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt, and I'm going to say he wasn't defending Schofield. Maybe he was just giving us more ammo against Schofield on there. I'm just a nice guy like that. Because, yeah, okay, he's one of the early guys that put that into print, and he was dead wrong on that too. I mean, Schofield, he thought Behemoth, that had a tail like a cedar, was a hippopotamus. You ever seen a tail on a hippopotamus? I, I'm, you know, the Schofield, that guy was messed up as all get out. But we have, we've all been made one. So Colossians 1.12 said we are partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Thir verse 13, we are translated into the kingdom of his dear son. Verse 10, he might gather together in one all things in Christ. In uh, Ephesians 2.11-14, he says he made both one referring to Israel and us. Ephesians 3, 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers. So we see that over and over again. So when reading the New Testament, it's crystal clear that there is one people of God and there is one Israel of God. However, many so-called theologians, they get confused when it starts coming to passages about Israel in the Old Testament. Because here's what, here's what people do, okay? We have all these verses here that talks about how this whole thing with the Gentiles was a mystery, okay? And what they do is whenever we're trying to say that certain things apply to us as believers that the Bible said was going to come on Israel in the Old Testament, you know, they'll go back to, you know, like, look in the book of Daniel. Where do you see the church mentioned in the book of Daniel? Well, why would he have mentioned the church in the book of Daniel? Because it was a mystery then. It was hidden then. That wasn't revealed until the New Testament. And they'll go back and they'll take all these Old Testament quotes about Israel and they will, once, what do they do? They're making them a separate group from us. And so you see here in the New Testament that no, God has made us both one. There are not two groups. There are one. If, Israel, if, if you're going to make Israel a separate group at all, then you have to declare them all lost 
and not the people of God. They're the, pe- the, the physical group was the one the kingdom was taken from. Now, under, but at the same time, all, you know, it's like you're saying that Abraham didn't get what God promised and, you know, all those, you know, David and all those people. No, because those guys, they were real Jews. They were one inwardly. They had the circumcision of the heart. They were believers and all the inheritance that they're going to get, I'm going to get too. And so, because we've been made partakers of, of their inheritance. And so, you know, let's look at some of these Old Testament passages though, and sh- with shining the light of the New Testament on it. Okay. And so I mentioned, I think I mentioned it Sunday night, Sam Gipp, he had went on a tirade with tweets and uh, just, I mean, he just went nuts on this subject and he after he the, he after this tirade of tweets he did the last one he did he said God inspired Romans chapter ten and eleven so no dishonest person could go to Romans nine nine and claim he totally disowned Israel and that's interesting I don't want to read into what he's saying right there but it sounded like he's saying you know God inspired chapter ten and eleven so don't you go back to Romans nine. You know, don't look at what, you know, ignore what Romans chapter nine says there, you know, because obviously he's looked and saw what Romans chapter nine says. Let's look at what Romans, let's look, we'll start reading in verse six. It says, not as though the word of God had taken none effect for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel, neither because they are the seed of Abraham. Are they all children? But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth, It was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Now the thing that people need to realize, you have to read 9, 10, and 11 all go together. And everybody wants to cherry pick the verses that they like, especially from Romans chapter 11. And when you get to the end of Romans chapter 11, I'm telling you, it, it, blew, it, it blew my mind when I finally got grasped this and got a hold of it. And it really kind of goes into another mystery. But I'm going to kind of include it with this one if I can get to it in time. But notice, um, you know, verse 21 he says, Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor, another unto dishonor? Now, we don't have time to look in it, but Jeremiah chapter 18. Okay, Jeremiah, that's a book that they love to go to, you know, to prove the Jews are still, physical Israel still God's chosen people. They love going to Jeremiah. But, you know, Jeremiah chapter 18 is where you have that parable of the potter and the clay. And it talks about God remaking Israel. We don't have time to go into all the details on that. I preached a message on that a while back. But it's an interesting thing just showing how God is going to take the kingdom that had been split. Okay, That you had the southern kingdom. Those were the Jews. And then you had the northern kingdom that it got intermingled with all the different groups. That, that group ended up being known as Gentiles. And God prophesied in there that he was going to make them both one again. Okay, and there's there's many other examples. There's the parable of what they give with the two sticks that he made into one, referring to the northern kingdom, the Gentiles, and the southern kingdom, the Jews, and he was going to make them one, just like we've been reading. Just like it wasn't super clear back then. Okay, it was dark. It was a mystery, but it's cleared up perfectly in the New Testament. And notice though how there in Romans chapter nine, which we're supposed to ignore. And just pay attention to chapter 10 and 11 and their verses they cherry pick. How it talks about, you know, Isaac was the seed of promise. And then he goes a little further, even with Jacob, all right? We are with Isaac, Galatians teaches that. And we're with Jacob too, okay? The, the Bible's very clear on that. And so, uh, go to Jeremiah chapter 31. So what Sam Gip did, he started this long tirade of tweets 
where he said, anyone who tries to steal the promise of Jewish restoration is a thief, a liar, and an untrustworthy teacher. And then he would put a scripture reference. And he just said that over again, that same statement over and over again with the scripture reference. And so let's look up these scripture references and let's shine the light of the New Testament. We don't have time to go to all of them. But Jeremiah 31 verse 11 is the first one he mentioned. It says, for the Lord hath redeemed Jacob. Okay. Now we see in Romans chapter 9 that we are included with him. Not because we physically descend from him, but because we are a promise. Abraham had two sons, one by a bondmaid, another by a free woman. Okay, the one of promise, that was Isaac. Bible puts him with us. Isaac had two sons. Okay, and the elder served the younger. Okay, and we are included with Jacob. Okay, not physically speaking. But spiritually speaking, okay, we, I don't know that if I descend from him or not. Chances are I do in some way, shape, or form, but that, that doesn't even really matter. Genealogies don't matter after Jesus Christ. So Jeremiah 31, uh, 1 verse 11, The Lord hath redeemed Jacob and ransomed him from the hand of him that was stronger than he. Therefore they shall come and sing in the height of Zion and shall flow together to the goodness of the Lord for wheat and for wine and for oil and for the young of the flock of the herd. And their soul shall be as a watered garden and they shall not sorrow any more at all. Then shall the virgin rejoice in the dance, both young men and old together. For I will turn their mourning into joy and will comfort them and make them rejoice from their sorrow. And I will satiate the soul of the priest with fatness and my people shall be satisfied with thy goodness, saith the Lord. Okay, now, that's a promise to Israel, right? Okay, but here's the thing. Have we not been made partakers with them? We've been made one with them. He's broken down the middle wall, partition. And we don't have time to go and read all these. I wish I could because I could really make fun of him on some of these too. Uh, but pretty much what he should have just done is just did like the whole chapters, but it's like he wanted to look, make it look like it was more references. So one time he, he would just do one verse and do the other one right after that. And he just, you know, he, and he goes through with all these. And yeah, and if, if I take time on showing all of his verses, it'll, I, I won't get to the good part of my message. But just understand that yes, there are promises to Israel, but does anybody think lost people, lost Jews are going to receive those promises? Okay, maybe some hardcore Ruckmanite, but most Baptists don't. Okay, and either way, those all those who were saved back then of Israel, the Bible says we've been made partakers with them. We are we are joint heirs with Christ. Those things were to promise to Abraham's seed, and that was Jesus Christ and those who are in Christ. So understand. That, you know, you can go back and look at those, use those Old Testament verses all you want. Where do you see the church in there? Well, I don't see the church. I see Israel. But if I look in the New Testament, I see that I've been made partaker with them. And so, you know, once again, you to do that, you have to ignore the New Testament. And that's exactly what they do. They ignore the better covenant. You know, the, the New Testament. And so anyway, uh, so let's go to, I uh, lost my spot. In my notes here. So yeah, so he goes through all those verses. So then Romans chapter 11. Let's go to Romans chapter 11 because this is where this is where it gets good. So understand, here we were, the Gentiles. Wicked, we're not even looking for righteousness. But the Bible says, you know, we found it. You know, the Jews who sought after righteousness, they didn't. Why? Because they sought it by the works of the law, not by faith. Somehow we got it. We don't deserve it. Not one bit. Why did God even love us? There was no reason for him to love us. There was nothing lovable about us, but he loved us anyway. And he has made us join heirs with Christ. And all those verses we read, and this is what drives me nuts with the repent of your sins crowd. All those verses where it talks about us getting salvation, and all these things, full credit goes to the blood of Christ. Nothing about it talks about how we change and how we turn from our sins. And we please God when we showed him our faith by our works. What did we do? We showed our faith by just asking for that free gift and doing nothing for it. Not paying anything, just accepting it and believing Him by faith. And so Romans chapter 11, well, let's, let's look at Zechariah. i got to show this one. He did this one. He made a big deal about this uh, verse at the conference when he talked about the whole he said, in the millennium, people aren't going to call Jesus Jesus. They're going to call him Emmanuel. Just like he was supposed to be named 
Emmanuel, but Mary and Joseph disobeyed God or disobeyed the angel and they named him Jesus. He was saying, and the millennium, everyone's going to call him Emmanuel. And this is one of the verses that he used to prove that. Look at this. Zechariah 8, 22. Yea, many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts in those days, it shall come to pass that 10 men shall take hold out of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew saying, we will go with you for we have heard that God is with you. God is with you. What does Emmanuel mean? God with us. Now, where in that passage is it saying we're calling him Emmanuel? It's just saying people, you know, they're going to take hold of the skirt of him that's a Jew and say, we've heard that God is with you. Make it once. What's he doing? You know, elevating the Jewish people again. Okay. And yes, the Bible does say that, doesn't it? But what does Romans chapter two say? Another forbidden verse that they don't want us to look at. He, verse 28, for he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart and the spirit, and not in the letter whose praise is not of God of men, but of God. So how can you take that verse in Zechariah and elevate the Jews with that? Physical Israel, when Romans chapter two says he is not a Jew that is one outwardly. How can you do that? And then how can you do that? Take that verse and say, yep, that proves they're not going to call him Jesus. They're going to call him Emmanuel because it says God is with you. I mean, just ridiculous. This is that, you know, and people keep getting offended at some of the things I've been saying about, you know, pre-tribbers and Zionists and because a lot of times I use the craziest of them as an example. And you know what? Maybe that that's not fair. And, and that's not what I mean to do. But I do like to show those things to show that you got to watch how that where that doctrine will lead you. And if you don't want me crediting you, if you are pre-trib and Zionist for the crazy things that guys like Gipper teaching, stop using him. Don't let him preach behind your pulpit. Otherwise, you know, we're going to assume you agree with some of those things. But listen, most pre-tribbers, most Zionists, they would never take Zechariah chapter eight. And, and interpret it the way he does. So I just want to say that not all pre-tribbers and Zionists are wacko coops. All right. They're, they're not, they're not all that bad. Okay. But Romans chapter two, you know, he's not, so, so what about the Jews? Okay. Cause we're all supposed to just pay attention to the verses they cherry pick from Romans chapter 11. Okay. And I, we don't have time to go through the whole chapter, but Romans chapter 11, their favorite verse in there is verse two, where it says, or verse 1, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Walk ye not what the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel. And it, they'll take that and then they just run with it. God's not done with Israel. God's not done with Israel. But once again, 9, 10, and 11, they all go together. You got you to look at all these things. And when you look at the context, when you look at what has been said in Romans chapter 2, where it says, for he is not a Jew that is one outwardly. And you all need to get this, because I think this is great. I think this is exciting. So this, he is not a Jew that is one outwardly. You get to Romans chapter 9. They are not all Israel that are of Israel. There are some pretty harsh things said about Israel in the book of Romans. And so it would be understandable if someone would read or, you know, Romans chapters one through 10 and think God's done with Israel. They're done for. They can't get saved. It wouldn't be, you know, I think Paul understood that people might see this and say God is done. Just like the Jews at one time looked at the Gentiles and said, God's not interested in them at all. If it's understandable that even us today, when we see how wicked the Jews are, that we might think God is done with them. In other words, he would never save them. I can understand. You know, it's, and so he's making the point here that, listen, they can still be saved. I'm proof of that. Okay. He said, I am an Israelite. He's of the tribe of Benjamin. Okay. And then he, and he goes on and then oh, let's go jump down to verse 11. Because this was the last one that Gip used, you know, uh, uh, the last one he tweeted, Romans chapter 11, verse 11. It says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, 
but rather through their false salvation has come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. God still wants them to get saved. God is doing, he, he was blessing the Gentiles. He was doing this work among the Gentiles. So they would see that and get jealous and say, you know what? We want that. God still wanted them to get saved. And God still wants them to get saved. If you know somebody that's a Jew, don't write them off. Give them the gospel. Okay? And don't do like some of these guys. Okay, Not all Zionists believe this. Not all pro-Jew people believe this. But you've got guys like Brian Sharp out there telling people, don't give them the gospel because if you do... And the rapture, and they don't get saved. When the rapture comes, they're going to be end up getting the strong delusion, and you're going to end up damning their soul to hell. And so, basically, you know, you give them a Bible, you know, you you try to, but but don't mention the name of Jesus. You know, tell them, you know, we support the Jews because a Jew did something great for us years ago. You know, at one time, and we just want to thank you for it. And, if they ask who that Jew is, just say, you know who he is. I mean, come on. You know, don't do that to them. Give them the gospel. Mention the name of Jesus. They might get offended. Well, they're going to go to hell if they don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I would rather offend them and give them a chance of getting saved than not offend them and love them into hell, which is what people are doing. But anyway... So verse 12, now if the fall of them be the riches of this world and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles and as much as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? That's the same thing it is with us when we get saved, isn't it? That's interesting. The receiving of them is life from the dead. That's what it is for us when we get saved. For if the first fruit be holy, then the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou, being a wild olive tree, were grafted among them, and with them partakest of the root and the fatness of the olive tree, boast not, thy, boast not against the branches, but if thou boast... Thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Notice that, you know, the olive tree. Who is the olive tree? A lot of people, the olive tree is Jesus. Okay? And they they were broken off because of unbelief. And um, let's jump down to, because uh, I don't have time to go through all these. Let's go down to verse 22. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness, if thou continue the goodness, otherwise thou shalt be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. They can still be saved. For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and wert grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? For I would not, brethren that you should be ignorant of this mystery. Okay, Now, I do think that this is a separate mystery here. But I want to include it with this one because of the fact that the mystery of the Gentiles is that we would be made one in Christ, that we would be made partakers of all the blessings with Old Testament Israel, with believing Israel, right? That was the mystery that God would take those wretched Gentiles and make them a part of the people of God. But now we've got another mystery, and this is a mystery of Israel. And notice this. He says, I would not even be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness and part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. And so all Israel shall be saved as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. Now, a lot of people, some people go crazy with that verse too. And not all pre-trib Zionists believe this either. I got to keep throwing that out there. Not all of them are crazy. Some of them are just saying when Jesus Christ returns at Armageddon, they're like, all, they're just all going to get saved. That's just stupid. All right. That's, that's more messed up than Calvinism. Okay. At least Calvinism, they think that people who are chosen are one, you know, ones who believe on Christ. This is like a Calvinism that chooses people that don't believe on Christ. I mean, that, that's really crazy. And so, and most of them don't believe that. 
Okay, but it's like they're still waiting for this future remnant out there. But you know, the remnant was already around during that time, and the remnant's still around today. It's just believing Jews because they can still be saved. But it says in verse twenty-seven, "For this is my covenant with them, and I shall take away their sins." As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. God made promises to their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Back in Deuteronomy chapter 4, I believe it was, God made a promise that even in tribulation, if they would call on Him, He would save them. Now, how can that be? Okay, we've kind of, things have kind of turned, haven't they? They used to look at the Gentiles and think, how could they be saved? And it's like now you've got these Gentiles. They're looking at the Jews and they're thinking, how can they be saved? Well, it's an amazing thing because God, He has a way of keeping His promises. And God promised their fathers that there would always be a remnant, that He would not cast them away. And look what it says in verse 30. He says, For as ye in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so have these also now not believed that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that He might have mercy upon all. You know what God did? You know what He's saying right here? Is just like at one time you were lost and you were able to become saved, God was able to do that with them too. But wait a minute, they were the branches that were broken off. Shouldn't they be done for? No, because you know what God did? This is the mystery right here of Israel. Is God, when He broke them off, as a way of keeping His promise to their fathers, you know what He did? He concluded them all in unrighteousness. What does that mean? He put them in the same place that we were. He made them just like we were when we were without Christ. And what did we have to do to get saved? We had to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And He saved us. And so instead of just breaking them off and casting them away, what did He do? He just put them in the same boat we are, so now they can still get saved, can't they? But they have to believe on Christ. Just like even in the Old Testament, not everyone that was of Israel was saved and went to heaven. There was many who didn't believe God and they died and they perished and they went to hell. And so we see here that God still, when He broke them off, He wanted He was going to be able to, He wanted to keep His promise to their fathers. So what He do? He put them in the same boat that we were in and made a way of salvation for them. And it just happens to be the same as our plan of salvation. Look what it's in then verse 33. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out for who hath known the mind of the Lord and who hath been his counselor. He said, what an amazing thing this was that just like it was an amazing thing when God took these wicked Gentiles and he made a way of salvation for them. God did something almost, you could say even more amazing is he took a people that rejected him. They completely rejected him as their Messiah. They put him on the cross. They crucified him. And so God had to break those branches off because of unbelief. But what did he do? He still made a way of salvation for them. What an amazing thing that is. Oh, the depth and riches. Do they deserve that? Absolutely not. We didn't deserve it either. Do you see how, why the Bible teaches in Galatians, you know, there is no difference between Jew nor Greek. He, God put no difference. There was a difference, but there isn't any more. So even today, they are. They're no different than us. They're no different than the Gentiles. They could be saved just like us. God doesn't look at them differently at, just because of their physical lineage. And for some reasons, preachers and theologians, they want to keep making them something else. They keep wanting to make them different. They're wanting to support a wicked nation and a wicked religion that doesn't even resemble Old Testament Judaism. Not understanding that there is only one people of God, and it's those who are in Christ. And so... The mystery of the restoration of Israel 
It's not a future thing that's going to happen to the physical Jews. The mystery here is how even though God broke off the natural branches, he still made a way of salvation for them. And what is that way? Verse 31, even, even so have these uh, also now not believed that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. So, I mean, just it, it's so clear. Their way of salvation is the same as ours. And so just like Gentiles were capable of salvation in the Old Testament, we didn't, and I, we, we didn't have time to go and show how sal- Gentiles were able to get saved in the Old Testament. Gentiles were able to become Jews in the Old Testament. At the Prophecy Conference, Pastor Joe Major preached a really good message on that, showing how in the Old Testament... They were able to become Jews. They could even become, they would even become one of the 12 tribes. Well, which one? Well, it depended on which land they lived in. They would receive the inheritance and they, you could be a Gentile or they didn't call them Gentiles back then, but you could be from another nation and you could come. And if you get circumcised and you do certain things, you would become a Jew. It, and it was spelled out in the Old Testament. So there's always been a way of salvation for all people. And there is still a way of salvation, even for Jews. We could talk about how wicked they are. We can talk about all those things they did. But you know what? God made a promise to their fathers that he would not cast them away. And so even though they rejected him, even though they crucified the Messiah, God went and he took them. And in a way only God can, he broke them off, which most of us would say that means they're done, right? But no, he concluded them all in unrighteousness. He put them in a category just like the one that we were in. So all they would have to do is do what we did to get saved and believe in Lord Jesus Christ. They can get saved without works. I mean, oh, the riches. I mean, what an amazing thing that God did. How God was able to keep His promise to Israel even though they did everything they could to lose it. Even though they did everything, they can still have the kingdom. They can still be a part of the blessings. They can still receive the inheritance. All they have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And what's crazy about that is most Jews would say, nope, I would rather go sacrifice lambs. I would rather do the circumcision. I would rather keep the feast. I mean, they, they would rather try doing all those things. Just like a lot of our Protestant people, you know, neighbors They would rather try just being a good person, obeying the Ten Commandments. Why don't you just receive the free gift? And God did that for them. God made a way of salvation for them, and he offers them for free just like us. And so what an amazing thing. So just like Gentiles were capable of salvation in the Old Testament, the Jews are capable of salvation right now through the mercy that God has given us. And so we are, we are one with the true Israel, with the true Israel seed of Abraham, because that seed is Christ. And all who are saved and all who have ever been saved are in Christ. And you you cannot honestly take the Bible and make two separate peoples of God. Not when there's all these places in the Bible where it says he's made us both one. Both one, partakers, join heirs, there is one bride. There are not two brides. That is, that is a horrible, horrible teaching. And they'll take, they'll cherry pick verses out of Romans chapter 11 when it's clear if they would read past the verses they'd like to cherry pick. That no, what it's teaching there is that they can be saved just like us. God didn't cast them away. God still made a way of salvation even for them because of that promise he made to their fathers. And what an amazing thing that is. And we, we, we cannot be like the rest of this world and not be amazed at our salvation. So it, it's, it's ridiculous. We should be blown away every day. We ought to thank God. Lord, I can't believe I'm going to heaven. I don't deserve that. But is that the attitude today? Is that the prevailing attitude today? Absolutely not. But that ought to be our attitude And for us to look at ourselves and think that we have any business going to heaven and for us to, especially as Christians, especially as Gentiles who understand what God did for us, for us to take 
a group like physical Jews and to just elevate them and put them on this pedestal and talk about them as the special people of God? Where in the world does that come from? And I tell you where it comes from. It comes from Judaizers who have been around. You know, Spencer Smith in his video, he talked about how we're conspiracy theorists. We want to blame everything on the Jews. Well, you know what? Go see who was bringing all the false doctrine in the churches in the early church. Who was it that was persecuting the Christians in the early church? Yes, it was the Jews. And what are all these crazy end times doctrines? What are they all about? It's all about propping up the Jews. It's all about lifting up the Jews. Who do you think might be behind that? Not some Gentile, unless they're getting paid by these people. I wonder about that sometimes. But listen, we're all one. Clear as a bell, no arguing it. And so with that, let's all stand.